Hello, welcome to Raymond Castile's Basement of Horror. Today we're going to look at the Imperial Universal Monsters from 1986. A few weeks ago we looked at the Amigos del Terror from Argentina. And those figures are knockoffs of the Imperial monsters. Wolfman was missing because the Amigos del Terror set does not include a Wolfman. But he is part of the official Imperial monsters licensed Universal Monsters set. Last year we looked at the Imperial King Kong and Godzilla toys. So we're not going to repeat those this time. We already did episodes on those. We're going to focus on the on the Universal Monsters. Now, we will see King Kong and Godzilla uh, by the end of this episode because they're in a boxed set. So we'll, we'll get to those uh, when we look at that box set. But for the most part, we're going to focus on these Universal characters. So as we did last time, let's just review Oh, there's Billy! How you doing, Billy? There's Billy. Okay, let's review quickly. Oh, I got cat crud all over my table. That's okay. Let's review these characters. So we looked at him last time. That is the Frankenstein. And there's his tag. That's what it looks like. The licensed Universal Monsters Frankenstein. I paused for a minute because I was about to say the Karloff Frankenstein, but yeah, I guess it's yeah, it's it's supposed to be the Karloff Frankenstein. I mean, it doesn't have an actor likeness, but it is supposed to be that original Frankenstein. And Billy is chewing at this camera, so you're going to see it. <laughs> you're going to see it uh, shake a little bit. Now, Billy, don't attack the camera, please. But we, you know, we looked at him last time on the Amigos del Terror episode. And we'll see him again. These same ones pop up a few times here. This is the Dracula. Here's his tag. He's a little more elaborate than the other ones because he has a cape. It's not flexible. All these things are PVC. I don't know if you call them vinyl. They're not like Japanese soft vinyl. It's more like a PVC. So, I mean, they're flexible, but it's a rigid material. It's not rubbery. Now, a member of the Basement of Horror Facebook group said he thought this this sculpt might have originated as a um, a Claude Aikens. Am I pronouncing that right? Claude Aikens. Sheriff Lobo figure. Because he thought this sculpt looked more like Claude Aikens than Bela Lugosi. Well, yeah, I see what he's talking about. But, uh, Uh, there, there's no reason to think that this was going to be a Sheriff Lobo head. There's no, there's no record of anyone you know, making Sheriff Lobo toys, and certainly Imperial wasn't going to do that. They didn't make action figures, really, until these monsters. They, they, I don't know if they ever made articulated action figures before these monsters. I think this was the only foray into jointed action figures 
at least during that era, maybe in more recent years, but not at that time. So here's here's the wolf man. We did not see him last time because he was not part of the Amigos del Terror set from Argentina. And they chose to give him a red shirt. It's always interesting to see what color they make the Wolfman's shirt. So since we didn't see him last time, let's take a closer look at him. I think it's actually a fairly decent Wolfman sculpt compared to some other sculpts we've seen. This isn't bad. I mean, with a different paint job, uh, I think that's this would look pretty nice. He's got really big hands. They all have big hands. Big, groping monster hands. And here's his feet. He has wolfy-looking feet. Now, he's not standing on his tiptoes. That's really... I mean, yes, that was in the movie, but as far as doing that with toys that's more of a modern thing you know with the hyper detailed modern toys kind of looks like bare feet does it not <laughs> i mean like like, uh, like yes it looks like bare feet i mean i mean like a grizzly bear you know like like the kind of bear that gets in your picnic basket that kind of bear b e a r kind of looks like b e a r bare feet uh, and a lot of people have said that the wolf man is kind of bear-like, um, that he's almost m more like the bear man than the wolf man. Um, that's, you know, that's been said before, and especially if he's depicted with brown fur. Wolves don't really, well, I don't, I don't want to say that no, no wolf has brown fur, but typically they have gray, black, silver fur. And the wolf man's very woolly, and his hair's thick and puffy and he's he has a bear like appearance definitely there's a they could have called him the bear man and no one would be the wiser but we know he's the wolf man here's the mummy i don't think i finished my thought on this dracula so this member of the group was saying that this was uh perhaps the dracula head it was a, a sheriff lobo uh, Claude Aiken's sculpt, and I do see the resemblance, but there's no evidence that anyone was making a Sheriff Lobo figure. If someone out there is, has heard of a, a Sheriff Lobo figure, you know, let me know in the comments, but I'd, I've never heard of any such thing, and certainly not from Imperial. Why would Imperial have access to that sculpt anyway if it's not their toy? You know, it, it's... It's simply a crude sculpt of Bela Lugosi. And uh, let, me, let me go back to this Dracula since we're back on the topic of him. Incidentally, is his lining red? Yeah, it is. He has, it, it's hard to see, but he has red lining there. You can see it there. He does have red lining in his cape. So this head, no, that, that's not Sheriff Lobo. That, but I say it's a crude attempt to sculpt Bela Lugosi. But for a rack toy of this, you know, this is kind of really cheap, crude rack toy, I think it's actually pretty good. I mean, does it look like Bela Lugosi really? No, but you can tell who it's supposed to be. It's not a very good likeness of Bela Lugosi, but it, it looks more like Bela than a lot of modern Dracula toys, which are completely different. They just look like some guy because they don't have the Bela Lugosi license. This one, I don't think they had uh, a Lugosi license, but... And I don't know what, what the situation was with the Lugosi license at that time in 1986. I know it changed... Um, like, for instance, the Remco. Remco was able to make the little Bela Lugosi Dracula figure. Um, so the situation with that licensing changed, but maybe it changed back by 
this time. I don't know. I don't know what the current state of affairs was with Lugosi licensing in 1986. But I think it's just a, a crude attempt at sculpting Bela Lugosi. But crude as it may be, I think it's actually not bad for the kind of toy that it is. I mean, you know, compared to this, this Frankenstein. <laughs> I mean, look at that. And I think I said in the other video, you can see he has almost tentacle-like arms, long arms, and huge hands. Well, I think he is modeled off a Sakuda Japanese vinyl model kit that does actually look a lot like this. It's more refined than this. It's not exactly like this, but you can tell that's where they got the idea for this sculpt was from that Japanese model kit. It, it does look, and it does have long arms and oversized hands like that. Well, I'm, I'm, I keep thinking of different things to say, so I keep bringing them back. Look at, um, so, I mean, he kind of looks like Clint Eastwood, <laughs> like an older Clint Eastwood. My brother, years and years ago, thought this looked like Ronald Reagan. He thought whoever sculpted this deliberately made it look like Ronald Reagan. And it was either intended as a tribute to Reagan or as a critique of Reagan. That someone either really liked or really hated Ronald Reagan, and for that reason they sculpted this Frankenstein to look like him. I see what he was saying, just like the Sheriff Lobo uh, for similarity. I see what he was saying. It, it, yeah, I kind of see a little Reagan in there, but I think this is a crude Boris Karloff, and I, this other one's a crude Bela Lugosi. And the Wolfman is a really not half bad Lon Chaney Jr. Wolfman. And I like how red and orange he is. He's just, he's like a Halloween Wolfman. Look at those bright colors. I like that. But you know, we've talked before about how Universal, their style guide, kept, kept mandating that the Wolfman look orange. So they, in this case, if, if that was in effect when they made this, then I can see w how, why it turned out this way. But I think this looks good. I like this kooky, Halloween-y orange. I think that works. It's a cute toy. On a, on a crude rack toy, it's fine. On a more you know, higher-end, refined, detailed toy, it, yeah, it doesn't work. Okay, so now finally, poor Mummy. He was, he was about to step on stage, and then we called him back. Oh, uh, what's going on with your tag here? I'll probably destroy it right here on camera. Okay. Okay, here is the mummy. So this is actually my favorite of the line. This is Claris from Abbott and Costello, Meet the Mummy. No, it's not. I'm sh it's not officially. They don't say on the packaging that that's what it is, but that's what it is. This is, this is the mummy from Abbott and Costello meet the mummy, and his name is Clarus. Clarus. And I, he's a, actually a pretty darn good representation of that character. You know, that, that version of the mummy is kind of lumpy and goofy looking, lovably so. And so is this. And this is not the first time that Claris was merchandised. The lunchbox, remember that? We did an episode on the Aladdin lunchbox. On the thermos inside that lunchbox, there is a picture of Claris. This Claris representing the mummy on the thermos inside that lunchbox. So this is not the first time that Claris was used in monster merchandising. And I think that lunchbox is 1979, if I remember correctly. So interesting that 
that uh, Universal was on a Claris kick for a while. And just just for the heck of it, here's here's the Toho licensed standard Godzilla. And they made different sizes. And, you know, if you go to that Godzilla episode from last year, you'll see different sizes. Well, you'll see two sizes. You'll see this size, and you'll see a much bigger one. A, you know, one twice as big as this. And uh, Imperial made these in different years. And I don't know, without double-checking what the first year was, they didn't coincide exactly with these Universal Monsters. The Giant Monster toys came out first, and then the Universal ones. Okay, so that's... We did our little review now of these cute little monsters. And I like these. I like these crazy monsters. They're crude. They're weird. They're chintzy. They're clumsy. They're clunky. But I like them. I like these Imperial toys. So speaking of Imperial, let us talk. I'm looking over at my cat, seeing what he's doing over there. He's looking at something. Billy, okay? Yeah, you all right, Billy? Just checking on you. Okay, so let's talk about Imperial. Imperial Toy Company. They were founded in 1969 by Fred Court, K-O-R-T. And he was a Holocaust survivor who immigrated to the United States after World War II. He wanted, you know, this I'm assuming came from some kind of uh, Im official Imperial Company history, the way this is worded. So this isn't my, uh, my take on it. This is comes from information online. Mr. Court, because he was in the Holocaust when he was young, he, he, there was a lot of uh, turmoil in his childhood. He really didn't get to have a childhood. Uh, so he wanted to make up for the lost years of his childhood by bringing joy to other children by starting a toy company and giving other children the childhood that he was denied. So that was his inspiration to start a toy company. Imperial made all kinds of stuff. Uh, they did a lot of thing, a lot of bubble-oriented toys, like blowing bubbles, tons and tons of rack toys of all kinds. And in their later years, they did a lot of licensed stuff. Oh, like like superheroes and comic book characters and all kinds of things. That was later in their history. Uh, in their earlier years, it was mostly generic rack toys. But the reason Imperial was important to me as a child was because they made rubber jigglers. All kinds of rubber, soft rubber toys. Mostly animals, like uh, zoo animals. They made kangaroos and bears and sharks and dogs and alligators and snakes. They had a series called the Imperial Zoo. And even though they're not monster toys, I think one day I'll do an episode on it. I mean, they're rubber toys. They're, they're, they're monster adjacent just because they're rubber. But I loved that those zoo animals from Imperial. I had a lot of them. And uh, today I have quite a few tagged Imperial rubber animals. They, in the midst of that, they did one licensed toy. A gr they took their polar bear and turned it into a grizzly bear by molding it in brown instead of white. And they issued that as a licensed grizzly from the horror movie Grizzly. So there's a, a Jaws ripoff called Grizzly from the 70s, and Imperial made a licensed figure based on that movie. And I had that as a kid, and I've got a couple of them today, or, you know, as a collector. And I really like that toy. But that was the only m monster they made, unless you count sharks or, or something like that. They had dinosaurs. I loved their dinosaurs as a kid. They had lots of rubber dinosaurs. 
and uh, all this was like soft, squishy rubber. But in the 80s, they moved to more rigid PVC. And uh, some collectors call those China sores because they're made in China. The earlier stuff was made in Hong Kong as far as what it, what's written on the toys is made in Hong Kong. Then the later stuff says made in China. And then that's when they switched to a material more like this, this rigid PVC. And they made a whole bunch of dinosaurs and dragons and unicorns. And that's become a kind of collecting subgenre on its own. People who collect those hard PVC imperial dinosaurs. So that's China sore collecting. I don't have a lot of those because that's a little after my era. I like the soft rubber stuff. But one of these days I'll 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 buy some more of that China sore later imperial stuff. Um, I would like to have more than I do. I have a couple, but not not many. But they made quite a few things like that. And it was in that period when they were making that kind of stuff that they made these monsters. So like I said, there really, I don't think there were any monsters in their history besides that grizzly from the horror movie. And uh, unless you count a shark or a dinosaur, there really weren't any monsters until Godzilla, King Kong, and these. So the Imperial made 900 products. Now I don't know if that was when they ended or if that was throughout their history. I think they, throughout their history, probably made a lot more than 900 products. That's probably what, what they were making in their final years. Uh, they made all kinds of rack toys and stuff. It, it was a rack toy company. They didn't make high-end toys. They made rack toys. The company was sold in 2006. The two presidents of Imperial, Peter Tiger and Art Hirsch, bought the company from the Court family in 2006. So the two guys that were running the company bought it from the founding family. But in 2019, I mean, they didn't have it for long. And in 2019, the company filed for bankruptcy. And then it was sold to Jaru Incorporated. And that's J-A-R-U Inc. And uh, it's two names put together. I think it's Jack and Russell. So I don't know if it's Jaru, 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 I don't know. I'll say Jaru. They're based in Florida. And uh, now if you go to the Imperial website, like the URL, like imperialtoys.com or whatever it is, something like that, it redirects to Jeru. So Imperial on its own no longer has a, its own online presence. It used to. There used to be an Imperial website. Now there's not. Now there's, it goes to Jeru. So Jeru, Jeru bought the company in 2019 after it filed for bankruptcy. Imperial was based in California, and it had approximately 80 employees in the United States, but worldwide it employed 800 people. And it had a revenue of $106 million in its final years, $106 million. So it was a pretty big company, and it was doing quite well, but from what I've read, the problem, well, the reason it went into bankruptcy, there were issues with tariffs and a lot of different different problems coming together at the same time and that forced them into bankruptcy and they sold the company so you know, it's too bad it's not around anymore uh, and it's interesting that it made it so close to the present day I mean 2019 is just you know it practically is you know the present day but it's just what three years ago so they they were around that recently. So that's a little bit of the history of Imperial Toys. Well, let's go back to the monsters. So we looked at the figures individually. Um, well, I, I guess we'll just look at the carded ones. So this is how I first encountered these. I think I saw these before I saw the loose ones. 
And there's a really nice counter display. My friend Matt Jaycox has one, and he has supplied some photos for us to see what this thing looks like. And it's actually a pretty nice box. I mean, you, it would be nice to have one of these counter displays and uh, try to fill it up with figures. And when you see them turn up, they usually don't have the figures in them. It's usually just the box. So these, these are carded versions. So we talked about the loose ones that came in the counter display box. Or some people, I think, call them dump boxes. I call it counter display box. And they were sold that way, but they were also sold in these, on these bubble cards. So let's look at the card here. And it's interesting how when it comes to these vintage cards, I don't get a lot of glare and reflection in the plastic. It, you know, works pretty well. But on anything modern, you can see my entire basement reflected. So I wonder what the difference is between the material that they're using now in the bubbles and the box windows versus the vintage material, because this is not very reflective at all, really. You know, a little bit, if I try, I can get a little, but you know, you can't see my basement <laughs> reflected in that plastic. Anyway, it's pretty much the same toy. I don't see any obvious difference. It's painted the same way. And it's got a really lovely card. I mean, they all do. The cards are very impressive. Beautiful artwork. It's got a lab scene in the background, kind of like Lincoln Monsters. They have those, those environments behind them. There's a Universal logo. And then this is before the blood splatter. In the 90s, Universal adopted this blood splatter logo that was on everything. And then they made all the packaging green and purple. This is before that. And here is the back. And we've got some nice little illustrations of the monsters back here. And so, you, you know, earlier I was saying was, this was supposed to be Karloff, and you can see right there, yeah, it's based on the Karloff Frankenstein. And you can even see how the sculpt reflects that image right there. Now, here's Dracula. I don't know where that image came from. But it does have a Bela Lugosi look. Definitely looks like it's meant to suggest Bela Lugosi. There's the Wolfman. That's definitely Lon Chaney Jr. For sure. And there's our good friend Claris. And I recognize that promotional still that that, that image is taken from. All of these are probably taken from promotional stills. All these illustrations. Except that Dracula. I'm not sure if that is from an actual Lugosi promo photo. I don't know. So let me see what if there's anything interesting to read on the back of these or the front. So they've all got Universal Pictures Company copyrights. including Dracula. Dracula is licensed as well. And the company is called Imperial Toy Corporation on this card, based in Los Angeles, California. Made in China, it says on the card. But these loose figures with the tags say made in Hong Kong. Let me just be sure of that. Here's Dracula's tag is the easiest to access. Yep, made in Hong Kong. So that's interesting that the carded ones say made in China and the uh, tagged ones say made in Hong Kong. 
anything interesting on the front. Posable arms and head. Seven and a half. Oh, it says seven and a half inches by eleven inches, but that's the card. That's not the toy. Made in China, 1986. Copyright 1986. A lot of writing on the side here. That's just universal copyright information. Um, there's, a, <laughs> there's a lightning storm outside the window. Well, let's just take another look at this before we put it away. So I like how there's an open door behind him. Again, very Lincoln-esque, like you just step through that door. And there's the lightning in the window. So it creates quite a scene. I like that. And these were hanging in Toys R Us stores, hanging on the peg hooks for years and years. So I don't know how successful they were. Maybe, maybe they're so successful that they kept ordering more of them. You know, or maybe they were the same ones, but I, I don't think they were the same ones hanging around all that time because they're, I bought these at Toys R Us. And you can see these cards are really nice, so they're not old, beat up, clearance aisle cards. And I bought these in the 90s, the early 90s. So from 86 to the early 90s. Now I see that I see this poor Dracula's got a crack in his bubble. I don't think that's always been there. I think that's happened over time. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to get worse and worse, probably. Yeah, it's his shoe pushing on her. Yeah, maybe I ought to put a little piece of tape on there just to keep it from spreading. You know, with these old toys, every time you look at them, <laughs> you can see a little something's gone wrong. That's the way it is with old stuff. Well, anyway, here's, here's the Dracula. And he kind of has that arms up in the air pose that is on the illustration. See? So they're sort of trying to mimic that. He's trying to scare you with his arms up like that. He just came down those steps, obviously. He went through that door, and he came down the steps, and now he's here to bite you. Some bats in the window. Well, it's distressing to find a crack in his bubble. I know that was not... Like I said, I bought these brand new at Toys R Us. So any damage that's been done has happened since then. Yeah, just no matter what you do to try to take care of this stuff, it, everything gets old and brittle. And it just, you know, deteriorates over time. So here's the wolf man. And um, so far, I haven't seen any difference between the carded figures and the loose figures. Maybe watching this later, I'll, on, on, on the screen, I'll see something I didn't see with the naked eye. But it seems like they're the exact same figures in every way. Well, anyway, here's the Wolfman. He has an impressive card, doesn't he? That is a very impressive card. That really looks nice.
and he looks nice on, on the card. I mean, just the whole presentation is very nice. He's in a graveyard. And there's a wolf howling at the moon there. Of course, we have a full moon. And the forest back there. He just came out of the forest to the graveyard. What's that? Oh, it's a house. Uh-oh. Is that a house back there? Yeah. So whoever's in that house, it better lock their doors. Bar their windows. Why are they living in that spooky place in the woods with cemetery and wolves howling and wolfman prowling around and all? Oh my gosh, why are you why are you living there? Well, I, I like this a lot. I think this the whole presentation is is very nicely done. I mean, the uh, the artwork makes a big difference. I'm trying to see if there's anything like a little Easter egg on the tombstones. Nah, nothing like that. I don't see anything like that. Yeah, it's a little house back there. Huh. Okay, well, put him right there. Here's the... Here's the mummy. You're not falling apart, are you? No. Well, that's interesting that this... This has a Made in China sticker so I wonder if under that sticker it says Made in Hong Kong. I don't know, because the other ones don't have a sticker like that. Well, anyway, here's Claris. Just looking at the artwork to see if there's something I want to point out. There's Claris, the mummy. He has a compared to the other ones, he's got a very bright, happy looking background. It's nice blue sky, and sandy desert. I guess he's on the Giza Plateau. There's the Sphinx. I don't know if Zahi Hawass is around. There's the uh, one of the pyramids back there. I would think there'd be a lot of tourists in this area. So I don't know if this is where Clarice really wants to be. Maybe Howard Carter might turn up. I don't know. He, there he is. Claris. So he gets a nice sunny background. He's not, it's not night times, no moon, no bats, no storm, no sketchy, creepy area. Just, he's on the Giza Plateau, one of the biggest tourist attractions in the world. Just to the side of the card, I'm sure there's a thousand tourists taking pictures of him and saying, what is that guy dressed like a mummy? What is, why is he walking around like that? So I, I like this background. It's bright. It's different. It would have been interesting if, kind of like the Lincoln mummy, he'd been in a tomb and maybe there'd be the entrance to the tomb and like the desert outside of that entrance. So he, but he would be in the tomb and about to leave. That's more like what the Lincoln mummy depicts on, on the artwork for that figure. But I, I like this bright, it, it, it's different. Oh, I should show you the uh, sticker I was telling you about. See that sticker there? The metallic sticker. So the other ones don't have that. They're made in China. So I'm wondering what's behind that sticker. Maybe nothing, but it's interesting that it, this one has a sticker and the other ones don't. So 
there are the four main toys in this Imperial Universal Monsters universe. But Imperial didn't stop there. They made a whole host of crazy things. They, they really went all in on the Universal Monsters. They could have just made these figures and that's it. But they made a ton of other stuff. I don't have everything, but I have a few things that I'm going to show you. Uh, and uh, I think I think we should start, because we're still on the figures. So let's finish the figures first. So I think this is what we'll do. I think we'll look at this. Because it's still uh, oriented to the figures. The other stuff has nothing to do with the figures. So this is a boxed set of the action figures. A boxed set. It's called Clash of the Movie Monsters. And it shows the actual toys in that photo. And then there, here is a, an artist's conception. It's interesting that Godzilla and King Kong are not facing each other. I guess they've already had their fight. Now they're running away from each other. I don't know. But Frankenstein and Dracula are confronting each other. Now, how weird is it that you have that woman back there? I mean, it, it almost looks like a Doctor Who image coming out of the TARDIS cause, because it's blue. You know, like uh, the Doctor or companions emerging from the TARDIS and seeing all this going on. Hmm. Maybe they landed in the wrong place, I don't know, or materialized in the wrong place. What else is going on here? Well, that's all hell's breaking loose because of the giant monsters. So all this havoc is going on with these giant monsters, but then also these two human-sized monsters, they're having a fight at the same time. The world's burning behind them, but Frankenstein and Dracula are going to have their little battle. And what is that lady doing? She intrigues me. I want to get a closer look at her. She's tied up. She's tied to the telephone booth. I didn't know that. What else is going on? Well, that's weird. So that lady, I didn't see it until I looked at it with the magnifying glass. She's got a rope tied around her. She is tied to the telephone booth. Now, how did that happen? Why did that happen? Is she like Fay Ray being offered to King Kong? You know, they don't have an altar like on Skull Island, so instead they use a telephone booth. I don't know. And interesting that in the photo, Kong and Godzilla are also facing away from each other in the photo. But Dracula and Frankenstein, they're having it out. It's a smackdown. They're going to settle this once and for all. Clash of the Movie Monsters. Made in Hong Kong, it says. Nineteen eighty-seven. This is copyright nineteen eighty-seven. And I, you know, in the last episode, I had a cold. I still have the cold. It's I think it's getting better, but it's still uh, kind of lingering. So you might see me sniffle or whatever. I'm still getting over this cold. Uh, let's see here. Can we get a shot inside of there? Well, um, maybe I should get that shot later. I don't know. Can we? Yeah, I guess you can see in there. That's what they look like in there. And I have, uh, I've 
I think I taken them out one time. And it was hard to get them back in because they were sort of intertwined. Let's see if we can get I don't know. Because we haven't seen Kong in this episode. Okay, let's just take Kong out. So we can get Kong in, included in the episode. So there's a licensed Imperial King Kong toy. And I do have one with a tag, and I do have one on a card. Same with Godzilla. I've got, I think you just saw the, uh, well, I have a, a tagged one over here on the table. But I also have a carded one. So yes, they made the Godzilla and the King Kong tagged and carded, just like the Universal Monsters. This one coming in the box does not have a tag. But we saw Kong and Godzilla in those two episodes last year, so we don't need to go over them again now. I just want to, just for the sake of completeness, get Kong in included. So there's that. So this is a really nice set. And uh, it's got cool artwork, crazy artwork. Uh, it's a nice box. Oh, here the top is a little different. Let's look at the top. Yeah, that's a different photo we haven't seen. And there again, Godzilla and King Kong, they're facing away from each other. I don't know what that's all about. I think it's might be a little better on the bottom. I think that it's a little less scuffed up on the bottom. One last look at this amazing box. What a crazy box. So that's everything with the figures. Now let's look at some of this other crazy stuff. First of all, let's look at these. These are magnetic disguise sets. That's for the Wolfman. So you see he comes in with all his I guess it's some kind of metallic dust and this magnetic wand and then you can move that dust around and, and paint it, I guess. I mean, if you if it's lying flat, it'll stay where you put it. And it's got the same artwork as on that card from the figure. But look, he's got, uh, well, you know, he's got, in this case, so it's the same background, but it's got the Wolfman's face and his claws on the card art and here on the back some funny looking pictures kind of looks like me oh you're supposed to use the wand from the back so you so you hold the card flat and then you put the wand on the back of the card hmm to move it around collect them all well there's only two so that shouldn't be too hard right bizarre what year is this 1987 made in Taiwan so a different country of origin. And Imperial had plants all over the world. Remember I said they had 800 employees. That's not in the United States. That's all around the world. They had about 80, 80 employees in the United States. But they had operations all over the world. They were a big company. So here is the Frankenstein magnetic disguise kit 
caution, plastic cover over Frankenstein's face should not be removed or opened. I would say not. What, what do you think that weird dust is? I'm sure it's not good for you. So there's the Frankenstein. Frankenstein Magnetic Disguise Kit. Or set, I should say. And there's the Frankenstein artwork. He's reaching out for you. Same, uh, same background as the figure card, but it's got the Frankenstein portrait on it. And yeah, let's see what Frankenstein, what can you do with Frankenstein? What can you make him look like? Ah, look at this. Look at these possibilities. And you can definitely tell that it's modeled off of Karloff. But there's no Karloff license. But it's definitely Karloff's Frankenstein. Lots of possibilities there. Pretty crazy toy, isn't it? But like I said, Imperial was a rack toy company. This is the kind of stuff they made. Weird stuff like this. Very interesting. Very odd. But not as odd as these. Paddle balls. Classic movie monster masher. Oh my goodness. Well. <laughs> Here is the Frankenstein paddle ball. And you can see the ball itself is smushed flat. It's dried up. It's a rubber ball. It's hard as a rock now. It's all smushed. Now I have another one of these. And in fact, I have multiples of all of these. And the ball is still round. So I don't know what happened to this one. But I, I decided to show you this one because the other one, the end is sticking out of the package a little bit. So there's Frankie. Very similar to the artwork on the magnetic set. And very, very unusual art up here. This Mount Rushmore of monsters. Why in the world would they do that? Mount Rushmore of monsters? What a strange idea. Now, I've seen that before, like uh, fan stuff, fan art or fan sculpture through the 90s and 2000s. But on a licensed product, I've never seen that before. Here's the four paddle balls. Imperial made a lot of outdoor type toys, stuff for kids to play with outside. That was one of their specialties. Like I was saying, they really did a lot of bubbles, like blowing bubbles, bubble oriented toys. So a paddle ball is the kind of thing you would go out in the backyard or out in the playground or something and, and play with that. So this is right up. Imperial's Alley to make a toy like this. Here's the mummy. Very detailed portrait of Claris. So as stupid as these panel balls may seem, they're pretty neat actually because you get this amazing artwork. They're overlooked, I think, because look at that art. What other licensed merchandise is going to have a detailed portrait of Claris like this? And you can see this ball still around. This is wacky. Whatever was going on with the Universal Monsters in the 80s, this is just wacky. But I like that there were so many weird things. And you know, the 80s was not exactly a time for classic monsters. You, when you think of like the eras when classic monsters were popular, 60s, 70s, especially mid-70s, and then again like uh, late 90s when the postage, postage stamps came out, 
and the sideshow and all that stuff into the early 2000s, those are the times when there were periods of, of intense interest, pop culture interest in the Universal Monsters. You don't really think of mid mid 1980s as a monster craze. So it, it's, it's, I mean, there was no monster, classic monster craze at that time. So it's odd that they went all in with all this Universal Monsters merchandise. I mean, I wonder what demand were they responding to with this stuff? Was there, was there a demand for something like this in 1986 or 7? And think about it. If you don't know what, who this is, it's just some guy. It's just some guy, some pale guy. Paddle ball. So they're, they're really depending on kids to know who this is. And I, I have a story about that in a second. But you're really, you're really depending on kids to know this is Dracula for, to, to sell this toy. He doesn't even have any fangs. Not exactly Lugosi looking, you know, Lugosi inspired, but not really, not really Lugosi. But this, now that is Lon Chaney Jr. That, that is, that is something. Look at that. I'd say if you're a Wolfman fan, you've got to own one of these. That is pretty darn good. It's a, from a classic promotional photo of Lon Chaney Jr. It's obvious what photo they, they used as the model for this. And uh, they just knocked it out of the park with this one. That looks intense. So I think these are underappreciated because people think of them as, as what they are, paddle balls, but they forget that they had this artwork on them. And the, the, where else are you going to find on a, a toy this kind of artwork of the Wolfman on a toy? You're not going to find it on an action figure, not like this. I mean, the Remco box has some great artwork. So yeah, there's that, the box art on the Remco's. But, I mean, that's the only other thing I could think of, really, that has large-scale, very detailed art of their faces like that, that so dramatically painted. You know, Halloween costume's not going to have that. It has cool art, but it's not going to look like that. So, so ha these paddle balls are, uh, I'm sure, you know, they're, they're a dime a dozen. They're, they're not rare or valuable. But uh, I think they're underrated because if nothing else, that, that Wolfman and the Mummy especially, that's just really impressive monster art. If it was like a, a Target set or something that was more uh, like monster kid friendly, like it was more like a 60s thing, then I think collectors would be all over these. But because they're paddle balls that you know collectors can't quite relate to it i was going to tell you something about dracula so let's get dracula back out so when i was buying this dracula at uh, toys r us and i didn't buy these at the same time i bought them one at a time like one a week i decided okay it's my time to buy these monster figures so every week i would just like every friday i'd go buy one for a month so when I bought this Dracula, I took this up to the the checkout lane and put it on the on the belt. And behind me there was a child and his mother, a, a young boy and his mother. And I don't know how old the young boy was, but elementary school age, you know, seven, eight, nine years old, something like that. And he got all excited when he saw this Dracula. And he wanted to tell his mom, like, Mom, 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 that's Count Dracula. And he was like, oh, yeah. Their mom, his mom was like, oh, yes, dear, that's very nice. 
and the child was, he, you don't understand, that's Count Dracula. That's Count Dracula. Count Dracula. He kept emphasizing it's not just Dracula, it's Count Dracula. And then his mom was like, oh, yes, very nice, very nice. Whatever. And so I, I thought that was cute, and I bought the figure and left, and the kid was all excited about the Count Dracula toy. And he wasn't just reading the card, because on the card, nowhere does it say Count Dracula. It just says Dracula. So this was a kid who was really into Dracula. He knew who this was. He knew the story behind the character. He knew he was Count Dracula. And he was really excited about that. So... And that's when you could buy the toys new at the store. So maybe Imperial did know what they were doing. And uh, there was some interest from kids in these things. I mean, they made them for a while, so they must have sold. Uh, I, I didn't look at the date on the paddle ball. Let me see. When was this? Uh, made in Taiwan. 1990. These paddle balls. 1990. So this thing started in 86 with the Universal ones. I think Godzilla and Kong were a little bit earlier, but the Universal ones in 86, and then 87 we saw on some of these, and now the paddle balls are 1990. Okay, so they made a set of bop bags, inflatable bop bags. And I only have one. They're kind of expensive. This is a Frankenstein, which I bought just for this episode. I didn't have this until a few weeks ago. Uh, I would have bought others, but you know, they're the only other one that's on eBay now is the Wolfman. He's 150 bucks, and boxes are there's two of them, and their boxes are beat up, have tape all around them. Yeah, uh, there was a there was a Dracula, and there was a mummy. Uh, looking at a few months ago, um, completed auctions when I was gearing up to do this episode, and I just they and they went for like forty five fifty bucks each, so they were reasonable. Uh, but I only so they they made a a Frankenstein, a Dracula, a Wolfman, and a mummy inflatable bop bag. I only have the Frankenstein, but this will be a representative example. I think I've got a. A catalog picture, if I'm not mistaken. A catalog picture that shows all four of the bop bags. So we can get them all in that way by looking at the catalog picture. So you can see the whole set that they made. But as far as an actual example in hand, I have this Frankenstein. So let's look at Frankie. You see this? This kid is very confident punching out Frankenstein. Yeah, Frankie is not going to get him. No way. I just like like how all the chutzpah of this little kid just pow, punching Frankenstein. 48-inch inflatable bop bag. It still has that artwork, see? That same artwork that we saw on the action figures. So nothing, nothing really different. Same art all over every side. Okay, let's see if we can open this up. I'm not going to inflate it, but we'll open it up and look at it. It's got sand in the bottom to weigh it down. Okay, I don't know if you're seeing that very well. <laughs> um, don't know what you're saying. Let's see if I can get on this camera. So that is the that's the artwork. Nice colors, very Ahi like Azrak Hamway like colors. I like that. Uh, there he is. And interesting, you can't really tell. I don't think looking at the camera, but this is 
translucent and then this artwork of the the uh, wall is on the back printed on this but the title and the character on the front so this is three-dimensional he's standing apart from the background when he's inflated he's going to be further ahead that's why the box is 3d on it that's the 3d they're talking about he's separated from the background So, that's about as much as I can show you there. That's the best I can do. I don't want to inflate this. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty, these bop bags, you know, all this stuff is cool, but it's overlooked because, I don't know, there's something a little off the beaten path about it. It's not, I don't know, maybe it's the era. If you want to, if you're looking for 80s toys, you're looking for he-man or turtles or something like that you're not looking for this stuff and if you're looking for monsters you're looking for 60s or 70s not this era maybe that's the whole thing it's the the era disconnects with collectors it, you have your 80s collectors you have your monster collectors monster collectors are generally not 80s collectors and 80s collectors are generally not monster collectors so that could be kind of what's going on there uh, it, what is this? This little thing. This is, I like, guess, tape to repair it if something goes wrong. Kind of reminds me of stretch toys with the little band-aids that come with them. Get in there. Yeah, I'll put this back in the box later. All right, so now... Uh, another inflatable toy. Okay. Hello. All right. So this is <laughs> the six foot inflatable Frankenstein. And I think this image does a pretty good job of depicting what it looks like and how big it is. Uh, so when I bought this, and I didn't look at the date on the bot, bot bag, let's see if I can see a date on this. <clears throat> 1986. So that's 1986. Let's see the bot bag. 1986. Okay, so... I bought this, I think I bought this before I bought the figures, and I bought it new, I think it was from KB, and I used it, I bought it really not so much to collect it, but to use it, and I, it was a Halloween display for a couple of Halloweens, I blew this guy up and had him at the door on display for Halloween, uh, and I should have a photo of him inflated so this is a very old photo this is like a 30 year old photo of him all blown up that's what he looked like and i remember i i, I he was so cool blown up i didn't want to deflate him so i left him inflated in the basement and my grandmother was staying for a while and I didn't tell her about this thing in the basement. And so she came down one day and the lights were off. There was some light, like some sunlight shining through the window, but it was still pretty dark. It was just illuminated this guy just the right way. So it looked like this tall, monstrous man was standing in the basement. And it scared her, scared the daylight, daylights out of her. Didn't scare her to death, no, she, she survived, but it scared the daylights out of her. She got quite a fright. So, well, I'm, how did I even get this back in the box? I'm impressed that I was able to do that. Here's some glue or something. <clears throat> yeah, 
I probably should not tempt fate and, and undo this guy. wanted to show you the head really it's all flat but this head is I mean, this this head is an impressive thing when it's inflated it, it looks like a I mean it is a mask basically it's a vinyl mask but I've seen a lot of people take the head separate it from the body and just display the head like a mask well I mean it's kind of hard to show you this thing <clears throat> can't really do much with that I think we'll just leave that there we can show you the box a little more there's a little closer look at the box Look at her. Oh no, she's all scared. He's not scared. I think it's I think it's his Frankenstein. He's proudly displaying his Frankenstein to this girl and she's she's frightened. I think that's the idea. I think he wanted to scare her. Cuz what little boy doesn't want to scare his sister or some other little girl? Boys are like that. They're made of snakes and snails and puppy dog tails. Big, fat snails. And you see that same artwork that we've seen before. The same artwork from the action figures. They got a lot of mileage out of that. And this is a pretty good representation of what this thing looks like. I mean, this photo on the box, that's pretty much it. That's what you got. I mean, you're looking at it right there. That's what it looks like. But this image kind of reminds me of... Um, oh, like those ads where you'd uh, send away for a like a mail order of Frankenstein and you you'd have like a in your imagination you'd have this Frankenstein buddy <laughs> giant Frank and they would turn out to be like a poster or whatever oh, what kid does or it also kind of reminds me of the my pet monster not the um, how to care for your monster that children's book with the uh, um, Oh, I forgot the author's name. He's very well known, but I forgot his name. But that How to Care for Your Monster, where it's like the, the care and feeding of various kinds of monsters, like how to take care of your pet Frankenstein or your pet Wolfman, your pet mummy. I loved that book when I was a kid. And this, is, this, this thing would be like your pet Frankenstein full size. Now, they also made a six-foot inflatable King Kong and a six foot inflatable Godzilla. I don't have either of those. I've wanted to get the Godzilla. You know, one of these days I might get the Godzilla, but I don't have that. Uh, they, they made a six, this, just like this, they made a six foot Godzilla, except he doesn't have a vinyl head, it's all inflatable. And they made a six foot King Kong. And the King Kong has, they both have interesting box arts. I really ought to have both of those, but I don't. Now, I thought they made a six-foot inflatable Dracula. I have a distinct memory when I bought this Frankenstein that there was also a very similar Dracula with the same kind of vinyl head and like a same sort of plastic material with a, a cape. But 
it must be a Mandela effect because I, I there's no record of any Imperial inflatable Dracula online uh, or in the catalogs from that era. My friend Matt Jaycox also remembered seeing the six foot Dracula. He thought he, that was right. Like he also remembers the six foot Dracula, but we both looked for evidence of its existence and it just must be a false memory because there's no record of it anywhere. So I don't know. There is a Pepsi Doritos promotional inflatable Dracula, which is very similar, and I have that. And it, it and I actually displayed that with this Frankenstein on Halloween. Um, so they're compatible, but the, that Dracula has uh, an inflatable head like like this material. It it doesn't have a vinyl hard head. So I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm conflating those memories. I'm not sure. So as far as I know, the, the only six foot monsters Imperial made was the Frankenstein, Godzilla, and King Kong. No Dracula, no mummy, no Wolfman. But they did make bop bags of mummy, Wolfman, Dracula, in addition to the Frankenstein I just showed you, and also uh, there's a Godzilla bop bag, which I have, and which I showed on the Godzilla episode last year. I don't know if there's a King Kong bop bag. I'm not sure about that. Uh, I don't know if someone out there can let us know whether there is or not. I don't, I'm not sure if there is. Well, let's see. I don't know what else I can say about these. I think we've reached the end of the line. Uh, I'm not... I, th I think I showed you a good selection of this stuff. Uh, I'm not sure if I showed you every little thing there is, but I showed you most of it, and as much as I could. And I just, um, I know these are not everyone's cup of tea, but I have a fondness for this bizarre 80s line of these monster toys. It, it's, they're, they're one of the last times that the monsters really uh, were a company appealed to children and made a big push with the classic monsters as children's toys. Even the Playco line from the 90s was kind of collector-oriented. I mean, it doesn't look like it. And the Playco line is very similar to these in many ways, and so much so some people wonder if there's some connection between them. As far as I know, there's no connection between the two lines. But the, Play the later Playco toys are very similar to these. But they were sort of collector-oriented, the way they were presented. And certainly the Hasbro and Sideshow were very collector-oriented. This might be the last time, if I'm not forgetting something, where the Universal Monsters were really presented in a big way to children. There was a big push with lots of merchandising, lots of different products designed for children. Where you could go to a toy aisle and see a bunch of Universal Monsters stuff for kids. Absolutely for kids. These are not collector's items. Well, they are now, but they weren't intended to be. These were made for kids. These are rack toys for children. And I keep thinking about that kid who was so excited about that Dracula and kept trying to tell his mom to, to recognize this character. This is Count Dracula. Count Dracula. So some kids were getting it back then. They were reaching a few. I'm sure most kids were more into Masters of the Universe or Turtles or I don't know, whatever else was big at the time. But uh, there were a few kids that still liked these old monsters for whatever reason. Maybe their parents introduced them. There was still a little bit of that mystique about the monsters in, in a way that they could appeal to kids. That You don't really see that now. I remember in the 90s, the early 90s, there was a, a set of of Halloween costumes based on the Universal Monsters. And they were very, very stylized. This was when the Just Toys Bendems, the original ones, came out. 
and they had the same kind of very stylized artwork on these Halloween costumes. And I was at Target, and I was looking at the costumes, and there was a wolf man, and there was a mom, again, with a little boy in the shopping cart, and she pointed out, well, she was pointing out different characters and saying, do you like this? And the boy was like, no. Would you like this character? No. How about this one? No. And then she got to the wolf man. How about this one? And the kid paused and then said, you got to be crazy. That was his response to the wolf man. Everything else was no, no. But wolf man, you got to be crazy. So something changed between Count Dracula and you got to be crazy a few years later. I think the, the, I mean, this is obviously a scientific survey, my personal anecdotal memories of indiv two individual kids. But anyway, it is evidence that there was some popularity among children. The monsters had some popularity among children still in the 80s. I mean, these are evidence of the, the fact that they made all these toys and they sold. These were not flops. They, they kept making them for years and years. Look at the dates, 86, 87, 1990. They kept making these things. So someone was buying them and it wasn't middle-aged men. It was, there were kids. And then in the 90s, where it seems like the bomb just fell out and kids were not interested anymore. And then it shifted over into the adult collector. By the time you get into the late 90s and the postage stamps and the Hasbros and the sideshows, it's the adult collector who's buying this stuff 80, 90%. Even though they were in toy stores like Toys R Us, the kids were not the ones buying them. They could, I'm sure some kids bought them, but that wasn't the main audience that like Hasbro or Sideshow were aiming at. They were aiming at adults. And certainly, Diamond Select and other later companies were aiming at adults. So in a way, these Imperial toys are the last gasp of the monsters aimed at kids in a big way. Not the odd item here or there, but a full line of, of all kinds of different toys. This little universe of Imperial Universal Monster toys all aimed squarely at children. And I, I think going into a store and seeing this stuff hanging there is not that different from seeing the Azurak Hanway toys or the Lincoln toys. Uh, the Remcos were a little more upscale, but some of these other rack toy monsters, it was the same experience in the 80s seeing this stuff hanging on the pig hooks. So it's nice that that generation of kids, for whoever it spoke to, the didn't speak to most of them, I'm sure, but I spoke to a few of them that they got that experience that we got in the 70s, seeing this stuff and having the opportunity to own and play with this stuff. So I have an appreciation for the Imperial Monsters. I mean, I like Imperial toys in general, but I have an appreciation for this very underrated, unsung toy line that doesn't get a lot of collector love. Not a lot of collectors are really into these. But I think it's a really interesting toy line. And I'm, I'm glad I have what I have. And I'd like to have a, maybe a few more things. But uh, I'm glad I have all these Imperial Monsters in my collection. Well, I think that's it. That's how I end the show. I say, I think that's it. Time to go. It's, it. yeah, it's, it's time to go. Uh, we said all we can say. So we have one more episode this season. We have the exciting season finale. So exciting. And then we're done. Then the fourth season is finished. One more episode. Unless there's some surprise review or something that I want to do in addition. I mean, that might come up. But aside from that, we've got one more proper episode to go and then we're done till Halloween well thank you for watching I appreciate you as an audience member I appreciate you thank you 
Until next time, Basement of Horror will return.